am surprised that I had not considered this question before, even though I am a scientist and have written poetry. It is interesting how compartmentalizing distinct activities can lead to failure to even think of examining any possible connections. So, let's consider first what each is mainly about. Science is mainly concerned with investigating phenomena in nature, finding explanations which can be tested and which lead to new predictions and or even useful applications. The basic engine driving it is a curiosity about how nature works, and this curiosity can ultimately only be satisfied by finding clear explanations that can be checked. Poetry, with some exceptions, a couple of which I will discuss below, is often concerned with evoking certain feelings, in addition to whatever other purpose a particular poem may have, e.g. tell a story, express an opinion, laud, memorialize a person thing event, raise questions on some topic, etc. The latter can also be achieved by other literary forms, but the evocation of sensations is most strongly associated with poetry. These sensations are, of course, subjective. If two people listen to the same poem, then there is no way either person can check whether the feelings evoked in the other person are the same as what oneself felt or whether they are different. And therein lies the rub. Our inability to measure, compare and objectively check such sensations puts poetry, at least to the extent that evoking such feelings is one of its main purposes, firmly outside the boundaries of science. Perhaps Paul Dirac had something like the above distinction in mind when he wrote. In science one tries to tell people, in such a way as to be understood by everyone, something that no one ever knew before. But in the case of poetry, it's the exact opposite. Someone who holds such a view might well believe that one cannot be scientific and poetic at the same time. But I think this view is too limiting. There are at least two kinds of situations where, it seems to me, Poetry and science do not need to be mutually exclusive. The first concerns the class of poems for which the point or meaning is crystal clear. Not all poetry is opaque, and that which isn't may still have structure in the service of evoking certain feelings, but it is secondary to the actual point. Now, I have the impression that because a poem's openness to interpretation is often regarded as an asset, rather than a liability, clarity of a point is not that highly valued in, serious, poetry, making it more likely that poems with a clear point are relegated to, say, the category of humorous or light poems. In fact, I am myself guilty of doing that. While a physics student, I participated in a limerick competition sponsored by the APS, and the set of limericks I submitted did end up winning my physics society some free pizzas. Absolutely. Science and poetic verse can wet and wed well. To answer this question with example, I will concentrate on one 19th 20th century poet, a master of verse, and as you will discover with the development of my response, a master at combining the beauty of science with the beauty of poetic verse. The poet is Englishman Alfred Noyes, 1880-1958. Noyes gained popularity with two very non-scientific narrative poems entitled, The Barrel Organ, 1913, and one of my very favorite narrative poems, the Highwayman, 1908, voted by many as one of the best poems for oral reading ever written. Noyes composed so much more as he aged, but perhaps no effort of his was as ambitious as The Torchbearers, a poetic trilogy that spanned eight years of composition. It was a scientific journey into astronomy, scientific discovery by the great scientists and medical personnel here on Earth, an examination of the evolution of geology and humanity, and a fictitious voyage where the world of technology and medicine do all in their united powers to save a young girl aboard ship in the Atlantic. The prologue of the first book in the trilogy, entitled, Watchers of the Sky, was motivated by the invitation of George Hale to California's Mount Wilson Observatory and its new 100-inch telescope. Hale, the conceiver and founder of the observatory, was the impetus, as it turned out, for Noy's ultimate narrative creation. And what a creation! The scholar and historian of science Frederick E. Brash writes that Noyes, journey up to the mountain's top, the observatory, the monastery, telescopes and mirrors, clockwork, switchboard, the lighted city below, planets and stars, atoms and electrons all are woven into, beautiful narrative poetry. It seems almost incredible that technical terms and concepts could lend themselves for that purpose. Noyes goes on to speak of the work of Newton, Copernicus, Herschel, 
Kepler, Galileo, seven great scientists in all, each getting a lengthy narrative devoted to their achievements. In the second volume of the trilogy entitled, The Book of Earth, Noise reflects on geology as a precursor to zoology, to the development of human origins, to Pythagoras, Gerth, Aristotle, Darwin, all with poetic presentation. And then, in his final volume entitled, The Last Voyage, the ship at sea with its doctor aboard who struggles to save the life of its young passenger, radios Johns Hopkins Hospital on land. Such wonderful technology. Can the hospital talk this onboard doctor through the necessary medical procedures to save the girl? Why not? This is modern technology in the early 1930s. Look how science has progressed through the years. Of course she just cannot perish. With doctors. Harvey and Pasteur and Lister on their shoulders, certainly the ship's surgeon and the doctors at Johns Hopkins will save her. But Noyes, at perhaps his poetic best, introduces faith into the scenario. They can only hope, they can only have faith, for her demise seems likely, and indeed the flicker of light vanishes. She dies. Not even the glory of science through the ages can conquer the inevitability of death. Most certainly this is just one example of many where the poet can weave and wed beautiful words of verse with the equally beautiful behavior of the sciences.